of straight lines together. And if you drew those straight lines with a crayon, you know, a fat crayon, and then you try to figure out where is the point there, it'd be hard to find. But if you keep it in here, then those hyperbolas are like that. And then it's real clear as to where it is. And I think that's fairly easy to accomplish. That's what we see here. Keep the, keep the beacons at least a ping's width away from major reflective surfaces. I, I'm very fortunate that it doesn't seem to care about the fact that it's right on a reflective surface, namely the floor. But, uh, but that seems to be okay. But having an additional reflective surface like the wall, if I were, were to put the beacon right in the corner uh, of where the wall is, it wouldn't work. So having it one ping's length away seems to solve that problem. Um, all right, then here's the, some fun facts. The echoes, we mentioned this, are louder than the direct path sounds. If you think about a corner reflector, it, it, or what was the example? You take a candle and you look at it, you get one candle. You put a mirror behind it, then all the light that's going that way comes back to you also, so the mirror doubles it. And if you make that mirror a corner reflector, you can get eight times as much light as what the candle sent to your eyes by itself, or seven times as much. So uh, echo, uh, corners are a big problem. And here's an example. There's beacon A. There's the echo off the ceiling in my house. So if you just said, oh, just do a three sigma uh, thresholding, one, two, three, ah, there it is, uh-uh, off by 12 feet. If your beacon would be in den count. So no good. That's a hard problem to solve. Another nuance is uh, filtering artifacts. Uh, if you, the better you filter it, the easier it is to, to find the ping, but filters always distort the thing that you're filtering. They always do that. And uh, the, a high-pass filter, which is chopping off the low frequencies, is going to cause a, a, a precursor. It's going to cause this startup at the beginning of it. So you know, try that sometime. Take, a, take an impulse and high-pass filter it, and you wind up with something that looks like this. It smears, it spreads it out. It's really bad. Here's the, here's the uh, hammer sign. There's what, was, what I'm trying to trigger on. But look how long this precursor is. Because see, there's the ambient, uh, there's the ambient noise floor. That little, you can barely see a little dashed black line there. That was one times the ambient noise. And that precursor starts there. And it's already bigger than the ambient noise. And I certainly wouldn't want it. That's a three sigma trigger on that. You'd be triggering on a thump, something that was caused by the filtering. And you say, well, just don't filter it. The air filters it. The air is a high-pass filter. You, like I said before, you can't pass DC through the air. You can't pass uh, air, uh, you know, uh, barometric pressure through the air. And, and, and since you, anyway, that means it's a high-pass filter. So this is going to happen no matter what. So you have to deal with it. Anyway, so, uh, and then people will say, well, just use a noise filter. You know, just set up a, a, an adaptive noise filter and get rid of the noise and be done. Those won't work either. Adaptive noise filters are entirely dependent on positive signal to noise. So, uh, but I tried it just just for fun. I tried it. I used Audacity's uh, noise filter, and let's see what it what it came up with. And this is with a very mild filtering. If you do really harsh filtering, it, it gets really bad. But here's a really mild example, and, and it may be hard to hear. So listen listen closely. Very hard to hear because it has filtered out a lot. That was the radio show and the two claps. And if you were listening real closely, you would hear the noise filters, the various bands opening up. So it's like a ghost. And the, the ghost of the clap is clap, clap. And then and then the, and the pings are gone because the pings are in the same frequency range as the radio broadcast. So noise filters won't work, including the really sophisticated ones because everything is at the same frequency range. And then people said, well, why don't you pick a frequency that, where there isn't noise? There's no such thing. They said, well, just use the hobbyist sonars. They're at 40 kilohertz. There's no noise there. Well, just because you can't hear it doesn't mean there's any noise there. And by the way, I did have some high-frequency microphones for a while. There is noise at those frequencies. When there's nothing in my house, I don't have a 40 kilohertz sonar in my house, but it was picking up like 25 and 30 kilohertz noise. And I, Hmm. Anyway, so the sample rates, that sample rates have got to be perfectly matched. That's a problem, especially with consumer equipment. Um, 
and you say, well, USB fixes that for me. I don't know, actually USB creates the problem because it allows the gain and loss of samples from, sam from, a, from frame to frame, the one kilohertz frames for USB. So deal with that. Products like the iMic, not iMac, but iMIC allow for uh, thousands of samples of jitter on that. So you have to be careful as to which tool you're using for that. So not all cheap stuff is, is the same cheapness. And Windows is not a real-time operating system, so be careful, it can mess things up too. Like if I let my laptop turn off its display while it's running, then it just sort of gives up on the audio hardware for a little while and it comes back. And it's like, well, if you're watching a movie, eh, yeah, kind of annoying, but not a big deal. But for something like this, to lose a thousand samples, big deal. All right. Then correlation. All right, everybody says, John, just correlate this stuff. That'll solve your problem. You just need to be using correlation. Correlation won't work because the echoes are correlated with the ping. I don't want to. I don't want to trigger on the echoes. The crosstalk is a perfect copy of the ping with no noise. It's perfect. It gets a perfect correlation. I don't want to trigger on the crosstalk. You know, uh, you uh, the uh, the uh, if you filter it too harshly the filter causes ringing, and the ringing is at the same frequency, so you trigger on that. So for this app, correlation is great for a variety of things, but not for this. It won't work for this. All right, and then autocorrelation and uh, crosstalk, we've talked about that. Just to give an example, here was a case where the microphone was right next to beacon C. It was like it was right, it was like right, like right next to this one, like a foot away. And when the ping went to beacon A, it, there was electronic crosstalk which caused beacon C to speak a little bit, and the microphone picked that up. Right? So this was, this was the noise. The problem is, that's like five times as loud as the ambient noise. So if you were doing correlation or if you are doing a three sigma trigger, you would have triggered on the crosstalk, which is in fact what I did before I saw, uh, realized that that was a problem. But what I do to solve that problem is I look ahead and I say, I see this loud thing coming up. I want to set my threshold at least 10% of the loud thing. And fortunately, that was good enough to, to ignore the crosstalk. All right, I can tell you're really thrilled with this. <laughs> we've done that, we've done that. Okay, a couple of big lessons and we're done. Lessons learned, sample rates must match. Big problem with consumer gear. There's no guarantee with consumer electronics that the sample rates are for anything. They don't guarantee anything. In fact, something like the, uh, it was the, the Griffin iMic, they're proud to not publish specifications. And they say that is, they, they do that so that they don't, so that when their specifications change, they don't have to, you know, tell you about it. Well, all right, that's great. But, but anyway, sample, I'm not trying to come down on them. I'm just saying that can't use their product for this application. You've got to have something with, where, where you know what the sample rates are, or at least that they're stable. They don't have to be exactly the same, but they have to be recalibrated somehow. Uh, professional gear, that would be built in, but this that would cost hundreds of dollars more. The dynamic range compression is useful. Filtering is less important than you might think. Filtering may not do you any good, except for the rumble filtering. filtering. Correlation in this application is completely useless, and beauty is cheap stuff does in fact work. We can do it with the cheapest hardware. And here's some fun facts. Use cheap speakers. So if you're thinking about, oh, I'll make this better. I'll use my home stereo. I'll use a ribbon driver. I'll use an electrostatic driver, big driver. All that does is to smear out the apparent location of that point source. It messes up the map. So don't use good speakers. Use small, cheap speakers. Use single driver speakers, not one with woofer and tweeter. Use one with single driver because the crossover inside there will actually change the wave shape coming out. Use cheap microphones for a similar reason. The really nice uh, vocal microphones for recording have like a one inch diaphragm in them. That also smears out the apparent location of where the sound came from, which you don't care about on a, a voice recording, but you do care about in this scientific application. Isolate the mic mechanically from the robot. And we say, oh yeah, that's to reduce the noise. It has nothing to do with noise. It has to do with the fact that if you attach the microphone mechanically to the robot, the robot becomes part of the microphone. So now you have, instead of having a, a quarter inch diameter microphone, you have a one foot diameter microphone. And where did the ping hit? You know, it messes it up, all right? And people make a big mistake on that. 
they say, well, the microphone on my cell phone is hard mounted to the cell phone and it works fine. So you look at the MIT Loud project and they put two microphones at a time on a printed circuit board and they had 500 of those circuit boards on this big three foot by six foot uh, uh, phased array. And I downloaded their data sets and I ran through my script and went, boy, this isn't working at all. You know, what in the world? And I thought, oh man, you know, they're smart people. And I started looking at it and I looked at the, their, their circuit board and I thought, boy, they hard mounted the microphones to that circuit board. I was like, I didn't think that would work. But it turns out, it doesn't work. <laughs> it doesn't work at all. So, so don't do that, okay? And you can see that's why I have the phone to, to isolate that. Um, all right. Very good. Uh, so the next steps, Paul and anybody interested is going to, you can use this. Uh, it, it could be something that could be set up at a competition and your robot could provide the audio data back to my script and the script could pass uh, localization data back to the robot. That's something Paul and I are working on to make that communication through, the, through a socket communication with the Wi-Fi. Cool stuff. I've never done that before, so I'm learning a hell of a lot from that. Uh, of course, next another thing would be really desirable to make it run really fast. Uh, if it's going to be outdoors, it needs to be weatherproofed, and uh, you know maybe maybe turn it into a product. I, it was not was not one of my goals, but if I could make some money off of this, that'd be really cool. That would be really just very cool. And so, can you get a copy of what I've done? You can get a copy of the slideshow. You can see exactly what I have laid out here. The thing I won't give you is the script. It's, write your own. <laughs> it, and this is the philosophy. In this process, there were some things I did. One of them was just a peak detector. All I wanted was something that said, peak. And I'd written a program that looked for positive going, and then it set a trigger, you know, set a, it was, it was arm. Then it would look for change in slope, and then it would trigger and say, and then back up one step and say, you're there. And it was like you know five or six lines of code, and I downloaded from Columbia University this thing that was one line of MATLAB code to do all of that. And I went, wow! And I looked at it and went, it took me like a half a day to parse out what they've done. And I went, oh man, that is really cool. And I used it for a while, and then eh, occasionally my script would just make huge mistakes. The thing is that they they weren't looking for the change in slope; they were just looking for whoop, and then if it didn't keep doing that, they said, oh, there's a peak. Well, what if it goes, uh, uh, and they said, peak, peak, uh-uh. So, and then even from MathWorks, the producers of MATLAB, their Sepstrom uh, algorithm has a huge error in it. Just, it, it crashed, I mean, it's like, and they've updated it twice. It's like, they didn't even find the anyway. And it took me like two days to figure that out because I thought, they can't have made that mistake. They can't have made that mistake. But they did. And it's still being distributed. So anyway, write your own. <laughs> All right, that's it, guys. Um, any other questions? Yes, sir. So really, it only runs on a PC with Windows running Mac.